freckle-faced 18-year-old who has a special quality of making people feel good about themselves. 19-year-old Susie Streeter. Stacy and Susie were best friends since the fourth grade. And Susie's mother, Cheryl Levitt, a bright, energetic woman who raised Susie as a single parent while working as a beautician. Her pride and joy, their immaculate home, and her beautiful daughter. Three women connected to their hometown only by hope and prayer. Heavenly Father, we are here in your house again today to pray for the same thing that we've been praying for. To pray that you bring Stacy and Susie and Cheryl back safe. We'd like to ask you again to please show us some sign to let us know that they're out there. Please let the person that has them feel guilt. Let him know that if he doesn't give them up now, then he's not going to go on with you. There can be no words to describe the anger and frustration and terror that is in our hearts. The police have no leads that I know of. And it's just like there's nothing I can do to help them. And it's the worst feeling. I feel like I'm helpless and I can't do anything about it. I miss my best friend. I miss spending time with her. I just miss her being around. On June 6, Susie Streeter and her childhood friend Stacy McCall graduated with Kickapoo High School's class of 92. The girls were gearing up for the summer of their lives. Susie and Stacy were part of an inseparable group of friends. Janelle Kirby was one of them. We got ready for graduation, and I drove, and I picked up Stacy, and then I picked up Adina, and then we met Susie, and then we all went to graduation. So. Afterwards, your dad got some funny shots of us. Yeah, I think it's too funny. Walked out, and Stacy didn't realize that her dad was videotaping us. So you see her walking around, and then she realizes, and her eyes get huge, and her mouth drops, and, and she turns away real quick. She goes, ah! And we came back home, and she was to change her clothes, and she was going with Janelle, and Adina, and Susie, and a bunch of friends to some graduation party. We were there all night until about 12.45, 1 o'clock. And I just said, let's all just go to my house and stay. But there was a lot of relatives there. So and Susie, there was no one at Susie's house but her mom. So Susie and Stacy just decided to go stay at Susie's house. The graduation party was to continue the next day at some nearby water slides. But Susie and Stacy never showed. Calls to the house the girls stayed in went unanswered all day long. I kept calling all day long. Me and Dina and Stacy's mom, we all called all day long. And then about 7.30, I just, I, we went back over there again. Janelle said the door was unlocked, so we tried the door handle and it opened and we went in. Susie's mom never left the front door unlocked, ever. And there was broken glass in front of the door. Her mom was a very neat person. She would not have left broken glass on the front doorstep where everybody walks in and out. And we kept hollering, anybody home? You know, Susie, Stacy, anyone home? And we walked in Susie's room, and to the left of the stairs is purses and wallets sitting on the floor. At first, I didn't even notice part of Stacy's clothes. And Lisa said, here's her shorts, here's her shoes. Everything was there except for Stacy, her yellow shirt, and her underwear. We even waited over at Susie's house for probably an hour and a half before we even called the police. Because we were just waiting for them to pull up in the driveway. Every time we heard a car, we were looking out the windows. The hours dragged on, and Stacy, Susie, and Susie's mom, Cheryl Levitt, never came home. All day Sunday, 18 friends and family members walked in and out of the Levitt home looking for the women, disturbing potential evidence. I know we have three missing women. We have uh, things in this house that shouldn't be the way they are. And uh, 
the determination as to why they're this way has not been made yet. We've not been able to nail down why. In the days following the disappearance, police and citizens combed every part of this Ozarks town, searching everywhere, especially where they hoped not to find them. People calling in and saying, well, you might want to check this river, you know, and it's like, you know, if they're in a river, then it means they're dead, and you're just like, you don't want to believe it. It makes you just sick to your stomach. Just sick to think, you know, that your best friend could be dead. I'm Mrs. McCall. I'm Mrs. In a relentless effort to bring their youngest daughter, Stacy, home, Stuart and Janice McCall continue to drive the search for all three missing women. That looks like Stacy looking right down at me. I, I think that's great. I think that the more people that see Stacy and Susie and Cheryl, somewhere someone's going to see him. The following is presented in the public interest from the Heart 98.7 FM. Stacy, Susie, Cheryl, we want you to know we're all still looking for you. The two basic theories that the department is working from at this time is that the individual responsible for their disappearance is someone that is readily known to this letter. The second theory that we are actively pursuing is that it's simply a transient abduction. Detectives continue checking all leads, while friends and family members pray with one voice for their safe return. But as time passes, the dread of the unknown deepens. That's what's the hardest. Neither one of us wants to go down and identify a body. I mean, every minute, they're on our mind, every second. If she's with someone that's holding her against her will, or if our worst fears are ever thought of, and if they come to be realized, then she's with God then too. We've been showing you these photos since the women vanished, but police are running out of leads. So please take one more careful look and see if you can help bring these women home. And remember, you can call and remain anonymous. The number's 1-800-CRIME-92. sure how many women were victims of our next fugitive. The FBI calls him a serial rapist, and agents need your help to stop him. Police say his first victim was a 12-year-old girl. It was a traumatic ordeal for her, but as you're about to see, she was still able to give police an incredible description, enough information to create this composite. The composite led police to this man, Donald Saldano. October 1971, Donald Saldano, just back from a tour in Vietnam, was cruising the streets in his hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. Excuse me. I was wondering if you can help me out a little bit. I'm kind of lost. You see, I'm looking for the library. I have these overdue library books. Do you know where it is? No, I don't really know. You don't, huh? Um, look, I see you go to St. Timothy's School. My little sister goes there. Yeah, what's her name? Joanie Cavanaugh. Oh. Look. Let me tell you, um, what you can do, you can do me a favor, and um, I'll give you a ride to school. What do you say? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, um, what I want, right? Get in the car. Get in the car. Ah! Donald Saldana rugged her out of the car, and he then uh, proceeded to sexually attack her. Uh, she resisted to the point uh, that she tried to avoid it happening, but him being a grown adult, her a 12-year-old girl, she was unable to resist him. And he eventually did have a sexual contact, which uh, included a rape itself. Oh, what a beautiful day. Let me tell you something, Marianne. Are you listening to me? Look at me when I talk. You tell anybody about this? I'll kill your family and your dog. You'll be left all alone. And I'll come back. And I'll find you. I will. I'll come back. 
come back for you. Now get out of my car now. Get out of my car! Come on, go! were kind of narrow and squinty-ish and and his eyebrows were bushy and that's it. That composite is almost identical to his actual photograph. So this young girl is a very, very good witness. Did he look anything like this? Yeah. His hair was might have been longer and his eyebrows were bushier. She described the car almost to a T, including uh, books that were in the car, a guitar case, uh, stickers from the local university, and the fact that the uh, radio was missing from the dashboard. He told me that if I cried, it would make him mad and I, I couldn't go home. He said if I told anyone, he'd get me again. The next day, local newspapers published Saldano's composite. Just hours after it hit the stands, Cincinnati police got a hot tip. Donald Saldano. What do you want? Cincinnati Police Department. So what? Well, I'll open up, please. Look at that. <laughs> Where'd he go? I don't know. He's got to be around here somewhere. <laughs> Say, Hank. Hank, I think he's up here. I think the most amazing is the fact that he's been able to elude law enforcement all the time. Where the hell he go? Every young girl on the street of any place in the United States, and every mother must worry about a guy like that being in their neighborhood. Saldano managed to stay one step ahead of the law. In August of 1977, he was in Los Angeles using the alias Richard Edward House. He'd changed his name, but not his habits. I'm new in town, and um, I'm looking for the library, you see? I have these books here, and I have to return them. Oh, the library! Oh, sure! Sure. The library, one second, is, um... You go down about two blocks down, and then make a left. Right, sure. Okay, great, thank you. Hey, what a cute baby that is. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you mind, you know, hopping in the car and maybe you can give me, you know, some directions? I'm really in a rush. I, I, I don't think so. Please? Come on, it'll take you two seconds. Uh, I don't... Come on, up. Come on. Okay. Yeah? Sure. All right, great. I'm back two blocks Hop in. attack a baby in the hands of a rapist more when we come back
camera aja sih. Eh bisa. Convicted of rape, as well as more than a dozen other sexual offenses, Soldano went to prison. He served his time as Richard House, and because of a computer error, police never learned his real name or connected him with the Cincinnati rape. Paroled in 1984, an older but not wiser Soldano was back on the street. At the time of his arrest, he was incarcerated for seven years. And yet, with our warrant in the uh, uh, national computer, no one picked up on the fact that he was wanted here. We had a set of his fingerprints. They were given to the FBI. And unfortunately, somewhere along the line, they were never put together with a man in California, Donald Saldana. February 1987. Saldano resurfaced in Salinas, California. Police say his next victim, the joyful mother of a bride-to-be, was preparing for her daughter's wedding the next day. Go inside and get his number. No, I'm sorry, I'm late. I have to go. Could you please? Because look, my mom's had a heart attack, oh, and uh, sorry. you know she's in the hospital, and she really needs to talk with him. Certainly, we'll go. Oh, great, thank you. I appreciate that. Congratulations, and what beautiful flowers they are. Thank you. <laughs> As I headed back in the building, he got ahead of me. And I noticed his jacket. It was just exactly the same as our school jacket. And I thought, that's odd. A lot of the other parents and students had jackets like that also. And I just wondered, you know, why this guy had one exactly like mine. OK. Well, let's see. I think the number's in here. As I went to either pick up the phone or look up the phone number, he he slugged me with his fist. Just relax. No! I guess it knocked all the breath out of me, and I kind of was blacked out for a little bit. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor. And he had me face down on the rug. He raped me. and. I just kept praying, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. God, let me live. <laughs> After I went home that night, I got up the next morning and got dressed, and we went on with my daughter's um, wedding reception. And as far as I know, not very many people knew there was anything wrong. 
I don't think I even told my kids until afterwards so that nothing would impart the joy of that day. And things just went on as normal. January 1992, Saldano surfaced again in Redmond, Washington. He was jailed for a domestic dispute, this time using the alias Richard Johnson. On January 27th, a fingerprint search revealed that Johnson was really Saldano. But just minutes before police confirmed his ID, Saldano had posted bond and disappeared. Finally, though, he was linked to the rape of the 12-year-old girl in Cincinnati, Ohio, more than 20 years after the attack. He told me that if I cried, it would make him mad and I couldn't go home. So he didn't get me again if I, if I, if I told anyone. He's trying to help me. I don't want him to ever come back. He hurt me really bad. <laughs> that young girl in Cincinnati, the woman in the church in Salinas, eight victims in Los Angeles, and who knows how many more. Clearly, this guy's got to be caught. Police say when he attacked the woman in the church in 1987, he made his biggest blunder. He left his fingerprint on that soda bottle in her car. That print tied everything together. Let police know they had a serial rapist on their hands. In 1989, Saldano was working as a day laborer in Washington State. He might still be working that kind of job, still be wearing a cap to hide his bald head. He's dangerous. He'll strike out at any time without provocation. You've seen Donald Nelson Saldano. Call 1-800-CRIME-92. Three weeks ago, we told you about baby Carrie, two-day-old infant stolen from the Alta Bates Hospital in Berkeley, California. When actress Whoopi Goldberg heard about it, she taped a public service announcement. This week, police released a new sketch of the abductor. Please pay close attention to this appeal. I was deeply saddened to learn about the kidnapping of baby Carrie, and I'm making this appeal on behalf of her family. At this moment, the woman who has baby Carrie is probably visiting with friends and neighbors and relatives, telling them about her new baby. You may even be living with this woman. If you know or just suspect that the infant recently brought into your home or neighborhood is baby Carrie, please show your humanity and help us return her to her real family. If you have any information at all, call the number on your screen right now. All calls are confidential. I'm asking you to do this because Carrie just can't do it for herself. Wouldn't you love hair this